I want to welcome Agile XRM to the podcast. I've known the people at Agile XRM for the past 12 years. I've seen how their business process management tool can add massive value to complex organizational processes in sectors such as finance and government. If you have complex processes or a need for dialogues on the Power Platform or Dynamics 365, take a look at how this BPM tool can add value. You can find them at agilexrm.com or check out the show notes for more details. Welcome to the MVP show. My intention is that you listen to the stories of these MVP guests and are inspired to become an MVP and bring value to the world through your skills. If you have not checked it out already, I do a YouTube series called How to Become an MVP. The link is in the show notes. With that, let's get on with the show. Today's guest is from Denmark. He's the founder, partner, and CEO of Projectum. He's currently in his 11th year as an MVP, going on 12 in renewal cycle at the moment. He's a dual Microsoft MVP and project portfolio management and business application since 2010. He's a member of Forbes Technology Council, writing articles on the future of work management and strategy realization. You can check out his blog, the Microsoft PPM or ppmblog.org. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you. Good to have you on the show, Peter. Tell me, what's your full name? Yeah. Good question. It's uh, Peter Charquero Kestenholz. Uh, wow. So is, my, it, is that Danish? Uh, none of it is. It's uh, Swiss, uh, the last part, and uh, from Uruguay, the middle the middle part, the middle name. It's from my wife's wow. side. Wow. Wow. That's so cool. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. I've, uh, I, uh, I've spent some time in Denmark. I particularly love the country. I've got two nephews that live there. Um in Denmark, one of my brothers married, um, I was going to say he married a Danish lady, but I think he actually ended up marrying three Danish ladies over the time he lived there, the 20 odd years he was there. And, um, and uh, yeah, so, so Denmark does have a, a place in my heart. Tell me about um, where, where do you live uh, in Denmark? What region? Yeah, I live uh, in, in the Copenhagen region, just uh, 10 kilometers from the, 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 the square almost of the center. Um, have been living here my entire life. So, um, yeah, I'm probably going to stay here as well. I really like it, uh, especially now when it's summertime. And, yeah, um, definitely when the sun is out, it's uh, it sort of makes everything more comfortable. Um, and then in the winter times, I sometimes miss living in the other part of the world where you live, where it's the opposite, I guess, summer and, um, yeah. Yeah, 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 totally, totally. So tell me a bit about your family. Yeah. Well, uh, my wife, Dariana, uh, again from uh, Uruguay originally, um, we live together and we've been together for uh, yeah 11 years now. And uh, then my kids uh, have Gabriel, who's 11, and my daughter, uh, Gloria, who's six. And uh, yeah, we live in a brand new nice house next to the, the forest. So um, one, one big happy family. Uh, no animals, though, yet. <laughs> yet, yet, yet. So... Tell tell me a bit about, I mean, I find that the topic today is going to be very interesting in that, you know, I want to understand how you became an MVP and, but interesting, I don't come across many folks that sit in this project portfolio management area and it's quite unique um, uh, area. So first of all, how did, how did you get into um, PPM? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I started off by being in sales uh, in another company before I founded this some 20 years ago almost, where I uh, was uh, hired in as a sales guy. Uh, the guy who owned the place gave me this big big box uh, with a product shot at it or a mock-up where it said Microsoft Project, and he asked if I've heard about it. I said no. And uh, he uh, told me that there's a big need for education uh, in terms of how to use this uh, client. So I started selling courses. Um, and learned that there's a big need for that in the market. And uh, after a short while, I, I thought that, you know, I think consulting in general perhaps is more needed than just uh, training. Um, yeah, and based on that, I, I sort of founded Projectum in uh, 2003, together with a couple of other guys, which was all about Microsoft Project, to be honest, Project Server, Project Central was the name back then. Um, 
And uh, yeah, then from there, SharePoint came in and many other things we'll probably discuss later. Uh, but that was the starting point, that there was a market. Um, and then I think my, my background was that I was actually uneducated. Um, after high school, I, I just went straight for, for work. Um, not in IT, but I've been working with IT in my basement as a kid since I was five. Um, just, you know, semi-coding, working with hardware. So I really had the flair for it, um, just didn't have the, uh, the formal education. Um, yeah, and then I learned that uh, I could quickly uh, reuse those skills, plus being good at selling, uh, which I was good at apparently. And uh, those two things combined made me, I guess, an, an entrepreneur uh, from when I was 20 years old. Mm-hmm. This, is, this is so good. This is so good. Tell me about, you know, you touched on Project the Client and Project Server and then SharePoint. Can you just give us a history of project, particularly, you know, the details of the last, let's say, four years, because it seems to have bounced, bounced around, bounced around a bit in that time. In my experience with the product and the people and my teams that have worked on the product, can you give me a bit of a history, um, you know, blow by blow all the way through, of the different products, how they diverged, merged, that type of thing over that time? Definitely, it's it's a crazy timeline. I have to admit, especially the last four years. Um, well, I think for, for those who, who are new to this area, first off, uh, Microsoft Project was there in 1984, which sort of says a lot. Um, that's when the, the the formula for how to calculate things was done. Um, so uh, work times duration equal units or work times units equals duration. And, and, and this sort of practice where you wanted the machine to predict or calculate your project plan for you. That, that's why Project was created, using the Gantt chart, of course. Um, when I sort of joined that club, uh, it was still 90% people using the desktop client of Microsoft Project. And then in 98, there was an experiment with something called Project Central that was before SharePoint. I think it was called Windows SharePoint Service 1.0 back then. Um, and then uh, in with Project Central, you could loosely connect these plans into a central uh, database and get the overview. Um, that sort of evolved in, into 2003, where SharePoint then really kicked in as an on-premise solution. Uh, so project plus SharePoint equals, you could say, uh, project managers and team members collaborating on not just tasks, but also documents, uh, chatting, contracts, uh, doing task updates, those sort of things. And then from Project Server 2003 came 2007, then 10, then 13, sort of following the, the SharePoint uh, evolution. Um, and then you're right. Then if we uh, fast forward to, uh, let's say, uh, 2018 um, or 19, maybe, around there, it was announced that uh, Project would change into something called Project for the Web. And I think at first glance, it sort of looked like Planner uh, because it was a copy of the Planner UI, but with a Gantt chart as well. Um, and also the secret source of it being sort of sitting on top of Dataverse um, back then. Or oh, Common Data Service was the name uh, originally, of course. And then f- fr- from there until today, what has happened is that Dynamics, that sort of came came through with also the Power Apps experience, model-driven, that is, that sort of evolved together with Teams, together with Planner, together with, I don't know, 20-plus task tools that Microsoft offers these days. And I think today in, in 2022, you have sort of two um, native project experiences. Uh, one is the project for the web, which is essentially an office application where most of the data is in Dataverse. So you can both use it as a power app or as a standalone office, ex- office experience like Planner. And the other part is project operations, which is a Dynamics product that came out of the PSA, uh, sort of the professional service solution that also utilizes project for the web. Still using it on Dataverse, but used differently. And I think uh, when I advise customers, because I get this question, I think, 10 times a day uh, in the last year, then Project for the Web is a quote to cash experience. If you are charging out or building out these uh, projects you're doing, project operations is probably just the solution you should, you should pick. If it's internal project or business case development, those sort of things, transformation programs, then you should use, I would say, Project for the Web in a Power Apps context. So uh, two very different things, but from a customer standpoint, when they hear the word project operations, they often feel like, okay, that can solve my project uh, needs. But 
but it's still for professional services. Yeah. Interesting, because, you know, the, the things, the bit of confusion I have in my mind is that um, however many years ago, Project um, moved into, if you like, the customer experience side of Microsoft engineering team. And we got the the build that's on CDS, as you, as you referred to. Then I understood that a whole, there was a rallying around of, no, actually, we needed to be part of the Dynamics 365 finance type part of the business because there's calculation of costs, revenue, that type of thing that needs to be included in projects. So therefore, it got moved back into that team. Um, but you've made you've made it clear now. So so really, one tool is designed for, hey, there's no billing involved. It's an internal project. If you're running it and you're inside your business, awesome. The other one is professional services. You're charging out project management um, and resources, etc. You should use the 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 was it project operations? Is it exactly yes? And the confusion, of course, is if you are a project online or project server customer today, then what? Uh, because then, then you, eighty percent of the customers I work with use Project Online for internal projects or, or pro- project development, so they cannot really move into project operations because it's it's it solves a different need. Um, so they're sort of forced into building a model lab experience all around Project for the Web that can sort of close the gap to what Project Online could. And that's where you could say today my company came from being uh, sort of 60, 60 consultants uh, doing consulting, where today half our revenue comes from the products or IP we have done on top of uh, Dataverse and the Power Apps. So that, that has happened fast because we sort of saw this, this unique opportunity to close the gap uh, with ready-to-go, very advanced PDF, PCF components. Um, so we have that as a, as an offering today. So we can migrate customers to either project operations or to a full, I would say power apps, dataverse uh, experience. So those products, you put them on app source. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So tell me what happened to then the client, you know, back in the day, I used to download a copy of project, you know, it was a desktop. Does that, does that still exist and fit in this ecosystem? Uh, definitely. Um, the, the project for the web, though, you can only import your your project. It's a one-off thing. Um, and I think what we've done then is, is sort of uh, enhance that experience so we can actually dual write, so both read and write back to the client. But I have to admit that less people are interested in the client. Uh, I spent most of my days at work uh, presenting, obviously, um, what project can do for them and Power Apps. And today, I think... More than half of the customers I work with work hybrid or in agile teams where, uh, first off, they probably have an agile tool already for that purpose of breaking down tasks. Um, and if they don't, um, they probably would, would, if they're not in software, they probably use stuff like Planner or maybe even Monday.com or Trello. Or, there are so many tools out there. So I have learned that these times I'm not trying to introduce a mandatory task tool mechanism. It's sort of the thing I let them decide. Obviously, I'm a fan of Project. I'm a fan of Power Apps. But if they prefer to use something else, by all means, go ahead. Because the problem today we want to solve is the overview of consolidating all these project plans or task tools into one big central overview, not in Power BI, but in a place where you can actually do what-if scenarios, uh, plan resource capacity, all those things. Um, So that's the sweet spot for for people like me today. That is actually above the, the task tool um so tool of choice is how i lead these these days uh, it's up it's up for them to decide what they prefer but i'm still able to through dataverse and, and uh power automate to sort of collect all the info inside one app so they can do these uh, scenarios uh, and planning ahead on strategy level interesting so you know when when project when microsoft first invented it did you say to what 1994 was it or 2004 uh, 84 84 84 okay so back then, obviously, waterfall was the main methodology when we when we think of project management. And and today, I don't know, but in my experience, we've seen a massive pivot to agile, um, uh, Scrum, that type of thing. What what are you seeing in the market in Europe? What what is it more typical? Do you see? Let's say if people are doing software implementation type projects, are you seeing more? A waterfall or more agile um, and, and when it comes to methodologies? 
Yeah, I here it's definitely a, a mix. It's hybrid. And I think it there has been a learning curve the last three years uh, in the Nordics, especially also in, in other parts of Europe. And I think everywhere in the world actually scaled Agile suddenly into the scene uh, some years back. Um, people took it as, as a Bible almost and introduced uh, release train engineers, value streams, themes, program managers, lots of new roles. And like with print, print 2 and PMI or any other handbook, after a few years, you, you don't throw it out, but <laughs> you adjust and I think uh, we are in the in the adjustment phase or era right now where people have learned that it's more about the way you want to work, so the way of working, than it is, uh, you know, according to a certain book you've read. So, so, so definitely what I see today is a missing link, regardless of methodology, between product teams or agile teams, fixed teams, to, uh, connected back to some sort of a, a strategy, strategic purpose. Um Obviously, you don't do cost-benefit analysis like in the old project days because the, the, the team is there until you let them go. They will just work every day. So you know the cost. So the, the whole point is about are they producing uh, the right output? Uh, can you measure it? And that's where I see that there's a big trend right now for uh, OKRs, so objectives and key results. And uh, that's a thing we've set up also in Dataverse, but that's also a thing that Microsoft purchased uh, from a leading global vendor last year which will uh, be uh, rolled out uh, later this year as part of Viva, uh, the employee experience. So I think we'll see lots of, of things happening there about setting strategic targets, tracking uh, the progression against those targets, um, and thereby av avoiding, you could say, the more traditional, let's call it benefit realization problem that no one, no one really was able to deliver on. Um, so strategy is, is sort of the trend right now, making sure that goes into a, a database as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The one of the one last question before we jump into the MVP side of things is that, in my experience, um, of, of implementing software and and seeing agile probably come into play heavily about um, in these type of projects about seven eight years ago, what I found is that the and you mentioned the word Bible, the peer, and, and I feel like it was almost like a religious fervor came from the Agile community on, on, on pure Agile and how you must run a project. And I remember one of my, my lead architects saying, you know, when I walk into a store and I buy a new television, I don't first quiz the salesperson about what methodology they use to build this you know, the tool, like, did you use Agile? Did you use Audible? Like, what was it? Because that's going to affect my buying decision. No, I'm wanting to buy the product and the end result. And I often found the religious fervor kind of came at the sacrifice of delivering an outcome on the project. It was more about how, you know, that we're being purist and Agile rather than actually the customer wants a, a, a solution and that's our primary driver. And, and I noticed that my Agile leads wanted to become the principal lead on the project, where I've always been a fan of my architects being the principal lead on a project, not my PMs. Um, and and did you did you observe that in Europe? What what was your experience? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think that the, the whole case here is that people explained agile teams as self controlling teams, and I think in that process many forgot that uh, it's multi dimensional. You are a person, you are part of a team, you do produce uh, some type of work, but end of the day, all of us who get salaries, we are an investment. If you're sitting in this agile team and you've been allowed to work for the next twelve months on a product, we can already predict the cost of you working on that product. So you're investing money. And because it's not a project anymore, we need to, to, to ask those questions we would normally ask the project sponsor to the team. And I think that there were some years where uh, if you went to an agile team and you asked, when are you done? Or uh, have, are things progressing as planned? Or uh, what's the cost? What's the return? They would sort of uh, push you out of the door immediately and tell you that you, you, sort of, you didn't understand agile and, and, and you know, the self-controlling part. And I think... I, I always have this, it's not a punchline, but when I go on stage and talk about this, I always explain to people that I've never, ever seen an empty backlog, ever. And, I, and everyone, has learned to, everyone has learned to prioritize it, which means that there's always something at the very top. Plus, they have learned to work in sprints, so they know that they can only fit X amount of uh, sort of features within that sprint. So if you ask an Agile team, no matter when you ask them, 
if they have more work identified than they can deal with right now, the answer would be yes, always. Which brings me to the next question. They will always be sort of missing out on more FTEs or more capacity. So they will ask for more developer capacity. It's a never ending story. And I think this is this is the point where we all have to lift up uh, and watch the whole thing from the from the sky almost and see that okay we have teams they have a cast they will never ever resign themselves so so if something has to happen someone needs to take that decision and that goes on above the team level so it's self controlling but within i would say company boundaries that are defined and uh People are used. People are ready for that. Uh, I think today, especially here in Europe, they don't boo at me anymore. So I think uh, we are there. But um, yeah, there, I still run into the problem uh, uh, as, as other occasions. Yeah, fantastic, Peter. Tell me a bit about your MVP journey. How did you become an MVP? Well, um, I didn't even know about the, the the program until I was starting to to do some blogging on WordPress here in Denmark, especially. Um, suddenly, some people liked it, and I was back then writing some some answers on TechNet. Uh, I don't even know if that was the name back then. Um, and then a, a guy said, "You should be an MVP because we don't have anyone who does that uh, for projects here in, in the Nordics." And I said, "What is it?" I got introduced, uh, and then I think uh, yeah, a year after or something like that, uh, suddenly I was uh, told by an email that. Uh, that I could be an MVP now uh, for what was called Project back then, which was great, um, both for me personally, having no uh, formal education, and you know, it was a big thing for me to, to, to get into that group. I always felt it was a, an, an engineer's group where I didn't really fit in. Um, but then I ended up there, and uh, that was great. I, I remember going to Redmond the first time, knowing no one, for almost the first time in the States, and uh, just looking at these 20 other people, and, and because that's a special part about Project. Being a project MVP, you're not among a thousand uh, developers. Uh, you are back then. I think we were 18 or 90, uh, 19. Sorry. So sitting in that room with the product group, probably they they had more people than we were in the room. So it was really a place to impact the backlog and the decisions uh, for features. Um, today, it's not being a project MVP anymore. It's being an office apps and services MVP. And then I'm also now an MVP in uh, in biz apps. So in Sort of both, uh, both, both places. So it's um, it wasn't a thing I planned for, but it happened, and I really, f- I must admit, it, it's been um, extremely important for my career, also as a founder and leader of a company, because I had these insights, um, obviously under NDA, but the 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 strategic decisions it allowed me to take um, with a good with a good heads up was extremely valuable uh, for me and uh, and my team. So quite often I couldn't explain the why. Uh, but people knew that I knew something that I couldn't share. So they accepted what I said and same thing with customers. Um, and that's still a thing uh, that I, that I seek. I, I join as many as these MVP calls as I can um, to, con- to continue to be a geek, to be honest, because I am still a geek and that's also why I created a company. Um, so 80% of my time is spent with the technical stuff still. Hey, thanks for listening. I'm your host, business application MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 guy. If you like the show and want to be a supporter, check out buymeacoffee.com forward slash NZ365 guy. Thanks again and see you next time.